David Denby. You asked the question in your most recent book, so you might as well answer it. Do the movies have a future? Well, yes. <laughs> it's a rhetorical question. Yes, of course, although I don't like the way big Hollywood is going, and I think that they're, you know, destroying themselves <laughs> as well as a good part of the movie business in the way they make these enormous movies that don't mean anything. Uh, they're, not, they're not laying the groundwork for grown-up taste, and grown-ups just peel off. They feel abandoned. Uh, most of the year, there's nothing for them. It, there's a kind of, they're sequestered into a 12-week season in the fall. There's a lot of interesting movies coming out this fall. There's no reason why those can't be made all year long. Grown-ups have a lot of time. They grew up loving movies. They've educated their children. They're free at night. They want to go out. They still, they still like that theatrical experience. Not everyone wants to stay home. And the big Hollywood, the six studios owned by six conglomerates, have given up on those people, basically. Basically given up. Uh, that's wrong. It's a bad business model. Well, this past summer's box office was only slightly down from last year's record box office, but most of that take yeah. came from superhero movies from Batman and Spider-Man. Do Oscar caliber, do smart movies still get made or is that financial model just broken? Some get made and they're mainly, mainly made by independent companies that get financing from everywhere and nowhere. There's no regular structure that makes these good movies and they're often financed at the last minute and money comes from, it comes from Meg Ellison. It, com you know, it comes from eccentric millionaires who of course will probably wind up losing their shirts. The big studios are not interested in that. And there's always this disjunction, you mentioned the Oscars, between what they make their money from all year and what they're willing to vote for at the end of the year. They know that the stuff that comes out in the summer with a lot of digits you know, flo floating around in dead space, are, that they're not interesting. You know the trouble with those movies? They leave you with nothing. You, you have, there's no imprint, no memory. You, all you remember is that you were excited for two hours. That's all there was. Uh, at nothing, you don't remember anything the next day. But meanwhile, TV, to a certain extent, has gotten smarter. You're seeing some yeah. shows like Homeland and The Sopranos. So has TV supplanted or replaced some of the smart uh, movie making? It has. Um, and some of the grown-up stuff, is, you know, and the psychologically interesting stuff. Don't forget, those big movies are made for the whole world. Two-thirds of the box office is overseas. So they've been defoliated, those movies of character, of psychology, of wit of sophistication they have to play everywhere. That, some of that is migrating into television, but it's a different experience. I'm a romantic about the movie theater. I like going to the theater, sitting in the dark with 500 strangers. It's a kind of religious experience. You ever look at anyone, people's eyes when they come out of a good movie? They look like zombies. Their eyes are all glazed because they're trying to play it over and over and hold, hold on to that image for another, another 10 minutes, another 15 minutes. And when it's a good movie, you do. You hold on to it forever. That's what's disappearing. But to kids today, so the future generation of, of movie, movie uh, goers also see it that way because they're watching movies on their tablets, on their iPads. So maybe they just don't appreciate or think that they're going to get their money's worth uh, from a movie unless they see Spider-Man uh, or Batman on the screen. That's what worries me, that the groundwork for adult taste in movies is not being laid in. That, in other words, they're catching these kids at seven and eight and nine and, and with franchises and holding them with, that, with repetitions and so on and selling them every way they can for another 15 or 20 years. And when they get older, and particularly when they have children, you know, and they're just going to peel off from the movie business. They're not building a grown-up audience. And, it, and if you put $250 million into a movie, if it doesn't succeed, the boss has to leave. That's not a good business model. It's a winner-take-all insanity. So how would you change it? How would you change things so the movies would indeed have a future? There are two ways out of this box that the six big studios have put themselves in. One is, is to play for smaller winners. To make a $20 million movie that will grow 60, and to make a whole bunch of them, make them more intelligent, bring the adult audience back in. You could arrive at the same net revenue at the end of the year, but by making five or six more interesting movies, but making them smaller, you know, and bring, back, bring that audience back. The other thing, the other way of doing it is what Steven Soderbergh, the director and writer, has been suggesting for years, which is to bring upfront costs way down by paying actors and directors a relatively, in Hollywood terms, small amount of money, a million bucks, say, if you're George Clooney or Brad Pitt, and the director gets 750000 and the cameraman gets 400000 Then you pay everyone f fixed percentages at the back end from the total revenue stream, wherever it comes from, the ancillary markets, overseas, sales to television, everything, forever, in perpetuity. So the payoff is slow, and the agents would get their fees at the end also, 
but it would but it would be slow, but it would be just as big if the movie was a hit. So, and, and that would, by bringing down upfront costs by 30, 40 percent, it would allow you to make less panicky choices, maybe, more interesting choices. That's, this is Soderbergh's been pushing this for a long time. 